Chapter Twenty Five, Part Two of Volume Three of A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Volume Three of A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times by Francois Guizot, translated by Robert Black. Chapter Twenty Five, Louis the Eleventh, fourteen sixty one to fourteen eighty three, Part Two. At the same time that, at the pinnacle of government and in his court, Louis was thus making his power felt, and was engaging a new set of servants, he was zealously endeavouring to win over, everywhere, the middle class and the populace. He left Rouen in the hands of its own inhabitants. In Guienne, in Auvergne, at Tours, he gave the burgesses authority to assemble, and his orders to the royal agents were, Whatever is done, see that it be answered for unto us by two of the most notable burgesses of the principal cities. At Rheim, the rumor ran that under King Louis there would be no more tax or talliage. When deputations went before him to complain of the weight of imposts, he would say, I thank you, my dear and good friends, for making such remonstrances to me. I have nothing more at heart than to put an end to all sorts of exactions, and to re-establish my kingdom in its ancient liberties." I have just been passing five years in the countries of my uncle of Burgundy, and there I saw good cities mighty rich and full of inhabitants, and folks well clad, well housed, well off, lacking nothing. The commerce there is great, and the communes there have fine privileges. When I came into my own kingdom I saw, on the contrary, houses in ruins, fields without tillage, men and women in rags, faces pinched and pale. It is a great pity and my soul is filled with sorrow at it. All my desire is to apply a remedy thereto, and with God's help we will bring it to pass. The good folks departed, charmed with such familiarity, so prodigal of hope. But facts before long gave the lie to words. When the time came for renewing at Rem the claim for local taxes, the people showed opposition, and all the papers were burned in the open street. The king employed stratagem, in order not to encounter overt resistance, he caused a large number of his folks to disguise themselves as tillers or artisans, and so entering the town, they were masters of it before the people could think of defending themselves. The ringleaders of the rebellion were drawn and quartered, and about a hundred persons were beheaded or hanged. At Angers, at Alencon, and at Arillac, there were similar outbursts similarly punished. From that moment it was easy to prognosticate that, with the new king, Familiarity would not prevent severity, or even cruelty. According to the requirements of the crisis, Louis had no more hesitation about violating than making promises, and all the while that he was seeking after popularity, he intended to make his power felt at any price. How could he have done without heavy imposts and submission on the part of the taxpayers? For it was not only at home in his own kingdom that he desired to be chief actor and master. He pushed his ambitions and his activity abroad into diverse European states. In Italy he had his own claimant to the throne of Naples, in opposition to the King of Aragon's. In Spain the kings of Aragon and Castile were in a state of rivalry and war. A sedition broke out in Catalonia. Louis XI lent the King of Aragon three hundred and fifty thousand golden crowns to help him in raising eleven hundred lances, and reducing the rebels. Civil war was devastating England. The houses of York and Lancaster were disputing the crown. Louis the Eleventh kept up relations with both sides, and without embroiling himself with the Duke of York, who became Edward the Fourth, he received at Chinon the heroic Margaret of Anjou, wife of Henry the Sixth, and lent twenty thousand pounds sterling to that prince, then disthroned, who undertook either to repay them within a year or to hand over Calais, when he was re-established upon his throne, to the King of France. In the same way, John the Second, King of Aragon, had put Roussillon and Cerdagne into the hands of Louis the Sixteenth, as a security for the loan of three hundred and fifty thousand crowns he had borrowed. Amidst all the plans and enterprises of his personal ambition, Louis was seriously concerned for the greatness of France, but he drew upon her resources and compromised her far beyond what was compatible with her real interests, by mixing himself up at every opportunity and by every sort of intrigue with the affairs and quarrels of the kings and peoples around him. In France itself he had quite enough of questions to be solved and perils to be surmounted, to absorb and satisfy the most vigilant and most active of men. 
four princes of very unequal power, but all equal for independence and preponderance, viz. Charles, Duke of Berry, his brother Francis the Second, Duke of Brittany, Philip the Good, Duke of Burgundy, his uncle, and John, Duke of Bourbon, his brother-in-law, were vassals whom he found very troublesome, and ever on the point of becoming dangerous. It was not long before he had proof of it. In 1463, two years after Louis's accession, the Duke of Burgundy sent one of his most trusty servants, John of Croix, sire de Chimay, to complain of certain royal acts, contrary, he said, to the Treaty of Arras, which in 1435 had regulated the relations between Burgundy and the crown. The envoy had great difficulty in getting audience of the king, who would not even listen for more than a single moment, and that as he was going out of his room, when almost without heeding he said abruptly, What manner of man, then, is this Duke of Burgundy? Is he of other metal than the other lords of the realm? Yes, sir, replied Chimay, he is of other metal, for he protected you and maintained you against the will of your father, King Charles, and against the opinion of all those who were opposed to you in the kingdom, which no other prince or lord would have dared to do. Louis went back into his room without a word. How dared you speak so to the king, said Dunois to Chimay. Had I been fifty leagues away from here, said the Burgundian, and had I thought that the king had an idea only of addressing such words to me, I would have come back express to speak to him as I have spoken. The Duke of Brittany was less puissant and less proudly served than the Duke of Burgundy, but being vain and inconsiderate, he was incessantly attempting to exalt himself above his condition of vassal, and to raise his duchy into a sovereignty, and when his pretensions were rejected he entered, at one time with the King of England, and at another with the Duke of Burgundy and the malcontents of France, upon intrigues which amounted very nearly to treason against the king, his suzerain. Charles, Louis's younger brother, was a soft and mediocre but jealous and timidly ambitious prince. He remembered, moreover, the preference and the wishes manifested in his account by Charles the Seventh, their common father, on his deathbed, and he considered his position as Duke of Berry very inferior to the hopes he believed himself entitled to nourish. Duke John of Bourbon, on espousing a sister of Louis the Eleventh had flattered himself that his marriage and the remembrance of the valour he had displayed, in 1450, at the Battle of Formigny, would be worth to him at least the sword of constable, but Louis had refused to give it him. When all these great malcontents saw Louis's popularity on the decline, and the king engaged abroad in diverse political designs, full of onerousness or embarrassment, they considered the moment to have come, and at the end of 1464 formed together an alliance for to remonstrate with the king, says Comyn, upon the bad order and injustice he kept up in his kingdom, considering themselves strong enough to force him if he would not mend his ways. And this war was called the common weal, because it was undertaken under colour of being for the common weal of the kingdom, which was soon converted into private weal. The aged Duke of Burgundy, sensible and weary as he was, gave only a hesitating and slack adherence to the League, but his son Charles, Count of Carolais, entered into it passionately, and the father was no more in a condition to resist his son than he was inclined to follow him. The number of the declared malcontents increased rapidly, and the chiefs received at Paris itself, in the church of Notre Dame, the adhesion and the signatures of those who wished to join them. They all wore, for recognition's sake, a band of red silk around their waists, and there were more than five hundred, says Oliver de la Marche, a confidential servant of the Count of Carolais, princes as well as knights, dames, damsels, and esquires, who were well acquainted with this alliance without the king's knowing anything, as yet, about it. It is difficult to believe the chronicler's last assertion. Louis the Eleventh, it is true, was more distrustful than far-sighted, and though he placed but little reliance in his advisers and servants, he had so much confidence in himself, his own sagacity, and his own ability, that he easily deluded himself about the perils of his position but the facts which have just been set forth were too serious and too patent to have escaped his notice. However that may be, he had no sooner obtained a clear insight into the League of the Princes than he set to work with his usual activity and knowledge of the world to checkmate it. To rally together his own partisans and to separate his foes, such was the twofold end he pursued, at first with some success. In a meeting of the Princes which was held at Tours, and in which friends and enemies were still mingled together, he used language which could not fail to meet their views. He was powerless, he said, 
to remedy the evils of the kingdom without the love and fealty of the princes of the blood and the other lords. They were the pillars of the state. Without their help, one man alone could not bear the weight of the crown. Many of those present declared their fealty. You are our king, our sovereign lord, said King Wren, Duke of Anjou. We thank you for the kind, gracious, and honest words you have just used to us. I say to you, on behalf of all our lords here present, that we will serve you in respect of and against every one, according as it may please you to order us. Louis, by a manifesto, addressed himself also to the good towns and to all his kingdom. He deplored therein the enticements which had been suffered to draw away his brother, the Duke of Berry, and other princes, churchmen, and nobles, who would never have consented to this league if they had borne in mind the horrible calamities of the kingdom, and especially the English, those ancient enemies, who might well come down again upon it as heretofore. They proclaim, said he, that they will abolish the imposts. That is what has always been declared by the seditious and rebellious. But instead of relieving, they ruin the poor people. Had I been willing to augment their pay, and permit them to trample their vassals under foot as in time past, they would never have given a thought to the common weal. They pretend that they desire to establish order everywhere, and yet they cannot endure it anywhere. Whilst I, without drawing from my people more than was drawn by the late king, pay my men-at-arms well, and keep them in a good state of discipline. Louis, in his latter words, was a little too boastful. He had very much augmented the imposts without assembling the estates, and without caring for the old public liberties. If he frequently repressed local tyranny on the part of the lords, he did not deny himself the practice of it. Amongst other tastes, he was passionately fond of the chase, and wherever he lived, he put it down amongst his neighbors, noble or other, without any regard for rights of lordship. Hounds, hawking birds, nets, snares, all the implements of hunting were forbidden. He even went so far, it is said, on one occasion, as to have two gentlemen's ears cut off for killing a hare on their own property. Nevertheless, the publication of his manifesto did him good service. Auvergne, Dauphiny, Languedoc, Lyon, and Bordeaux, turned a deaf ear to all temptations from the League of Princes. Paris, above all, remained faithful to the king. Orders were given at the Hôtel de Ville that the principal gates of the city should be walled up, and that there should be a nightly watch on the ramparts, and burgesses were warned to lay in provisions of arms and victual. Marshal Joachim Rouault, Lord of Gramache, arrived at Paris on the 30th of June, 1465, at the head of a body of men-at-arms, to protect the city against the Count of Carolet, who was coming up, and the king himself, not content with dispatching four of his chief officers to thank the Parisians for their loyal zeal, wrote to them that he would send the queen to lie in at Paris, the city he loved most in the world. Louis would have been glad to have nothing to do but to negotiate and talk. Though he was personally brave, he did not like war and its unforeseen issues. He belonged to the class of ambitious despots who prefer stratagem to force. But the very ablest speeches and artifices, even if they do not remain entirely fruitless, are not sufficient to reduce matters promptly to order, when great interests are threatened, passions violently excited, and factions let loose in the arena. Between the League of the Common Weal and Louis XI there was a question too great to be, at the very outset, settled peacefully. It was feudalism in decline, at grips with the kingship, which had been growing greater and greater for two centuries. The lords did not trust the king's promises, and one amongst those lords was too powerful to yield without a fight. At the beginning Louis had, in Auvergne and in Berry, some successes, which decided a few of the rebels, the most insignificant, to accept truces and enter upon a parley. But the great princes, the dukes of Burgundy, Brittany, and Berry, waxed more and more angry. The aged duke of Burgundy, Philip the Good himself, sobered and wearied as he was, threw himself passionately into the struggle. Go, said he to his son, Count Charles of Carolet, maintain thine honour well, and if thou have need of a hundred thousand more men to deliver thee from difficulty, I will myself lead them to thee. Charles marched promptly on Paris. Louis on his side moved thither, with the design and in the hope of getting in there without fighting. But the Burgundians, posted at Saint-Denis and the environs, barred his approach. His seneschal, Peter de Brise, advised him to first attack the Bretons, who were advancing to join the Burgundians. Louis, looking at him somewhat mistrustfully, said, "'You, too, Sir Seneschal, have signed this League of the Common Wheel.' "'Aye, sir,' answered Braze with a laugh, 
They have my signature, but you have myself. Would you be afraid to try conclusions with the Burgundians? continued the king. Nay, verily, replied the seneschal, I will let that be seen in the first battle. Louis continued his march on Paris. The two armies met at Montherry on the 16th of July, 1465. Breeze, who commanded the king's advance guard, immediately went into action, and was one of the first to be killed. Louis came up to his assistance with troops in rather loose order. The affair became hot and general. The French for a moment wavered, and a rumor ran through the ranks that the king had just been killed. "'No, my friends,' said Louis, taking off his helmet. "'No, I am not dead. Defend your king with good courage.' The wavering was transferred to the Burgundians. Count Charles himself was so closely pressed that a French man-at-arms had his hand on him, saying, "'Yield you, my lord, I know you well. Let not yourself be slain.' "'A rescue!' cried Charles. "'I'll not leave you, my friends, unless by death. I am here to live and die with you.' He was wounded by a sword-thrust which entered his neck between his helmet and his breastplate, badly fastened. Disorder set in on both sides, without either's being certain how things were, or being able to consider itself victorious. Night came on, and French and Burgundians encamped before Montherry. The Count of Carolet sat down on two heaps of straw, and had his wound dressed. Around him were the stripped corpses of the slain. As they were being moved to make room for him, a poor wounded creature, somewhat revived by the motion, recovered consciousness and asked for a drink. The Count made them pour wine down his throat, a drop of his own mixture. The Count made them pour down his throat a drop of his own mixture, for he never drank wine. The wounded man came completely to himself and recovered. It was one of the archers of his guard. Next day was brought to Charles that the Bretons were coming up, with their own duke, the Duke of Berry, and Count Dunois at their head. He went as far as Etampes to meet them, and informed them of what had just happened. The Duke of Berry was very much distressed. It was a great pity, he said, that so many people had been killed. He heartily wished that the war had never been begun. "'Did you hear,' said the Count of Carolet to his servants, "'how yonder fellow talks? "'He is upset at the sight of seven or eight hundred wounded men "'going about the town, folks who are nothing to him, "'and whom he does not even know. "'He would be still more upset if the matter touched him nearly. "'He is just the sort of fellow to readily make his own terms "'and leave us stuck in the mud. "'We must secure other friends.' "'And he forthwith made one of his people post off to England "'to draw closer the alliance between Burgundy and Edward the Fourth. End of chapter 25, part 2.